What's going on everybody? I'm at the store right now, just finished a day of pricing, and I figured, you know what, I think it's about time to do another one of my what did I take home from the store lately videos. If the algorithm has just fed you this video, unlikely, and you don't know who I am, my name's Matt, I run a record store called Too Many Records in Portland, Oregon, and I also have about 450 videos on YouTube since 2015, so go check those out if you have time. But right now I'm here to share with you some of the records that I have taken home, because I don't take all the good stuff, but sometimes certain records come by and I just have to take them home with me, add them to the collection. Now, I got a great assortment for this video, but first off, what I want to share with you is a record that I don't really know a lot about the origins, and I figured what better to do than to share it on YouTube and see if anyone can shed some light on it. I know a lot of people on here know far more than I do, so let's get started with that and see if anyone knows the origins. So this is a record, Sons minus seeds and stems. As you can see, it's pretty awesome art here with all the weed plants, but this is also known as a band called Sons of Champlin, which is a rock band, a psych rock band from the 60s, 70s, uh, I think even 80s, uh, and they actually are from where I grew up from ages 1 to 12, which is Marin County, California, which is wild. All of the other Sons records go for 5 to 15 bucks, from what I can tell. Pretty prevalent. You've probably seen Sons of Champlin records out and around when you're digging. But this one, I can almost guarantee with certainty, you have not seen. And that's because this one is private press. It was not on a label, and it's the only record they put out that was not on a label. Now, this came in in a trade-in. person said they found it in a flea market um, mixed in with a bunch of random jazz records, and they thought it looked cool, so they got it, and they traded it in. This is the first press from the 70s. There's also a pressing in the 90s that's somewhat hard to find, but I don't really know any details about this record. It's um pretty clean. I mean, there's a couple marks, but it plays VG Plus for sure. And... Uh, yeah, it's kind of jazzy. It's like jazz rock with a little bit of like some proggier elements at times, a little bit of psych elements, but the the cover is just so striking. It kind of reminded me of the logo of Farm, that record that uh, Dylan from Noble Records loves and, and reissued. Um, and I just have no context. I actually reached out to Dylan and I asked him if he knew about this one. He did not. Um, there's 10 halves on Discogs and a hundred and something wants. So a few people know about this, but I don't know the origins as to where this came from, why this was private press. It is a great record. Um, and if anyone has any info on it, I'd love to hear because there's one copy available for 800 something dollars, which is insane. Uh, but is it insane? I don't know. Uh, I'd love to hear some info on it. And now for something completely different. AFI's The Art of Drowning. I got this in a collection. It's on a really nice dark gray marble. I really like this record. I got into AFI a lot more than being a super casual fan after seeing them perform at when we were young fest. And this is kind of their punkier side. This isn't where they went a little more emo rock um, later on in their career, a little more Smiths-like even later on. Um, this is definitely more hardcore punk uh, but still catchy, not as kind of hardcore as their earliest, earliest stuff, but this is kind of bridging the gap between this and like December Underground and Sing the Sorrow, in my opinion. And I think this is an excellent, excellent record uh, front to back. So really excited to have this. Not an easy record to find, despite there being a lot of variants. I didn't put these in any order, so this is gonna be fun. This is Sweet's Destination Boulevard. You might know this record because of the big single on it, which is Ballroom Blitz, the opening track. But this whole record is just this manic kind of pop, hard rock, um, it's kind of hard to explain because I feel like it crosses a lot of genres, but the whole record is this theatrical rockin' adventure, and I really love it. I got it on a whim because I know Ballroom Blitz pretty well, and I was like, I wonder how the rest of the record sounds. I've never really heard a lot of sweet outside of that song, and this album did not disappoint. Speaking of pop, we also have Prefab Sprout, Steve McQueen. This record is a repress from 2019. Uh, but originally it was called Steve McQueen, then there were some issues, as you can imagine, um, and then it changed the name to something else. I can't remember off the top of my head, and I guess some of the represses are calling it Steve McQueen again. But Prefab Sprout is one of those bands that everything I've heard of theirs has been just meticulously produced, just unbelievable quality of songwriting and production on all of their records. I think that they are one of the most underrated pop acts. I just don't think people talk about them quite enough. You know, the people that love them love them, but I, I think that they deserve to be even more well-known than they are. They're not really talked about as some of the best pop of the 80s, unless you're talking about underrated pop. And I don't know, I think this stands up with some of the best stuff. Sop with Camel, The Miraculous Hump Returns from the Moon. 
wow. This is an interesting record from 1973. And truth be told, it is really just one song that forced me to take this home, even though the whole record is great. It's the first track, Fazon, F-A-Z-O-N. Do me a favor, after this video, cue up a YouTube video with the song Fazon by Sop With Camel if you have not heard it. It is maybe the most ahead of its time song I've ever heard. This song literally sounds like down tempo electronica, like like trip hop from the 90s. It is so ahead of its time. It's it's jazzy, it's funky, uh, it's, it's loungy. I love it. I think it's one of the coolest tracks from the 70s that I have personally ever heard. The whole album is very good, but that track is the absolute standout. I just, wow. The Jazz Collection is slowly growing. This is Saxophone Colossus by Sonny Rollins. Now, this record is considered to be one of the best jazz records of all time. I've heard it a handful of times. And this version is a 2002, I believe, cut by Kevin Gray. Kevin Gray can do no wrong. When, when a record of his comes to the shop that I like, and I don't have, I usually take it because the records he works on are a cut above in terms of sound quality, pun intended. This record sounds amazing despite not being an early pressing. They did a fantastic job with it and I just thought this will be my, my play copy for now until I stumble across a first press and I'll A-B test them because I can't imagine the first press sounding much better than this version sounds, but the first press goes for like $2,000, so. This is Play-Doh and Sean Patrick, We Buy Gold. Was not familiar with these guys at all. Got this in a collection, thought the cover was interesting and listened to it. It's almost like a Run the Jewels vibe of this kind of back and forth between these two MCs with really interesting beats. Is it as good as Run the Jewels? Not quite, but definitely kept my attention the whole way through. And I thought it was interesting enough to keep. If you like RTJ, check these guys out. Red Cross Neurotica. I have always heard of Red Cross, but I never really gave them a chance until this record came in. I thought the cover was creepy and weird and I wanted to listen to it. And I thought this record was one of the most charming, interesting rock albums I've maybe ever heard, at least definitely from the 80s. This came out in 87, and I would definitely say that it helped inspire grunge. There's a lot of elements of pre-grunge um, in this, as well as just some interesting kind of 80s rock sensibilities. I really enjoyed this record, and now I'm gonna have to dive into the rest of Red Cross's discography. If you guys know the next step I should take on that path, please let me know in the comments. Keaton Henson, Monument. Uh, this record is heartbreakingly beautiful. If you don't know Keaton Henson, he's a very fragile singer-songwriter, um, kind of like Jose Gonzalez, although even more uh, reserved, I would say, musically. And some of the music becomes a little more orchestral than Jose tends to get, but really, really pretty songwriting devastating at times, and this record is my favorite. I mean, just look at this cover, come on. This record is probably my favorite of all the records I've heard of his. We have a couple on the wall back there, but this one is the one I decided to take. I am so late to the Curtis Mayfield game. I mean, I, I got super fly. I did this in a previous video and showed you that I took that home. I had never heard this record front to back. I just love this album. This is a run out groove uh, pressing. I would love to find an original for a good price that's not beat up, but this one sounds pretty fantastic. If you like funk and soul, this record is a must own, and I don't know why it took me so long to listen to it. Is it Luppy or Loopy? I'm gonna say Loopy. Danielle Loopy and Parquet Quartz featuring Karen O of the Yeah Yeah Yeahs. This is Milano. This came out a while ago. This, I believe, yeah, this is the Vinyl We Please colored vinyl. I saw this come out, I saw the cover, I never really took it upon myself to listen to it. And a copy came in the store and I was like, I'm curious. I listen to eight hours of music a day. I could just take a chance on a lot of stuff. And this album floored me. Both Goose and I were like in love with it as we were listening to it. It's super angular. It has, you know, the sensibilities of Karen O on a lot of the tracks. So you're gonna get kind of that yeah, yeah, yeah vibe at times, but very angular is the best way I could put it. Really, really interesting, sophisticated kind of pop it's it's very, very good. Uh, I would definitely check it out if you like kind of synthy, angular stuff. William Tyler Goes West. This record is one of the most beautiful instrumental records I've ever heard. Uh, every single note is jaw-droppingly gorgeous. No vocals on this record, just a pure through line of amazing guitar work that takes you on a journey. You can forge your own story in your head as you listen to it. Just so good and such a great pressing too. Dead Silent, which is what music like this needs. Um, if you're a fan of like North Americans, I would definitely check out William Tyler as well. And this is by far my favorite thing I've heard of him. Claire Vincent, Raytons Mon Desir, definitely mispronounced that. This just came in in a trade-in by my friend George and I loved this. This is like 
amazing French pop. Pretty modern, it came out in 2016, but this was just great music. It literally put a smile on my face the entire time um, from the first note to the last. If you like French pop, definitely check this out. Bobby Humphrey, Blacks and Blues. Uh, this is one of those records, uh, the Mazelle Brothers, crushed it on this one. Just one of those great jazz funk records from the 70s featuring Bobby Humphrey's iconic flute playing. This is so good. This is an unofficial press, but man, it sounds really good. This is Rammstein's uh, exclusive live record, uh, Gold Son. And it has this really nice, the, the amount of effort for a bootleg put into this is crazy with the gold foil all over the cover. Um, but there's not a lot of live Rammstein on vinyl. I have the box set, but the set list is basically all my favorite songs, minus maybe one or two. And the sound quality is quite good. I don't know if it's soundboard, but it sounds like it could be. Um, really, really good. I'd grab it if you're a Rammstein fan. And I tracked down a first press of Merciful Fate, Don't Break the Oath. King Diamond Goodness. Um, I have a repress of this on colored vinyl, and this is not the cleanest version, unfortunately. This is definitely, I would say, teetering on VG, where the VG Plus, there's a little bit of crackle here and there, um, but it's a good starter copy. If I find a better copy, I'll upgrade, but definitely wanted to track down uh, first press of one of the most iconic metal albums of the 80s. Grab a copy of Speak of the Devil, Ozzy Osbourne. This is one of the few things that is not in the Ozzy box set I own. This is basically Ozzy and his band doing all Black Sabbath covers, which is wild and amazing. Uh, so good. I had a copy a while ago, it was a little crackly, so I sold it. Um, this copy sounds excellent though. Still not perfect. I think a lot of these just got a lot of play back in the day. I don't think I've ever seen like a absolutely pristine copy of this jacket or disc, but essential. I don't really take a lot of singles, but this single won me over because it's just a crazy array of people on here. So this is N.E.R.D. She Wants to Move uh, on the B-side, which is my favorite N.E.R.D. song. It's probably their biggest single, but it's my favorite thing they've ever done. Um, and that B1 is the Basement Jax remix. Basement Jax is insane. Um, really in your face, electronic. Um, they did that song, Where's Your Head At, which was huge. Um, really nice remix of the song, but the B2 the second song on here is the Native Tongue remix. And let me just read to you all of these MCs that are on this track. So the remix of She Wants to Move featuring Common, Most Deaf, De La Soul, and Q-Tip. You're literally getting elements of Tribe Called Quest, Black Star, De La Soul, Common. These are some of the greatest MCs to ever grace the mic. And all of them on one track is just crazy. So I had to grab this. It is a really killer remix. This came in in a trade and I couldn't say no. It is Blink-182's Self-Titled, which is one of their masterpieces. Um, a little more art rock than punk rock, but still totally a Blink album through and through. Some of their biggest songs like Feeling This and I Miss You are on there, as well as some fan favorites like Down. Um, the whole record is great though. It has some of those spacey elements that uh, Tom went on to do in Angels and Airwaves, but this record in particular is excellent and I didn't own it for some reason. I forgot to pick it up, all the different represses and pressings there were, um, but now I do own it. And just in time for the new record coming out soon. I just flipped past one that's a big one that I'm gonna save for the end. So if you were thinking about clicking off, don't do that yet. Rochelle Jordan, Play With The Changes. This is an artist I was not familiar with, but I was curious about, so I listened to it. And it is some of the most interesting and unique R&B from this era. A lot of R&B from the past, I don't know, 10 or 15 years has been a little sterile and not that interesting to me. So obviously some records jump above others, but this one really stood out for me. So if you enjoy modern R&B, this is a record you need to listen to. The beats on this go crazy. This one came in a trade as well. This is MF Blue. This is Blue and Spanish Ran. So Blue is an MC that loves MF Doom, just like the rest of us. And he paid tribute on this uh, kind of mm food inspired album. Visually, obviously it's a parody of mm food, but ultimately I just think this album is a great love letter to the style of rap that happens on the classic MF Doom record in food. I thought this record was fantastic and it is a limited edition of 50. Um, I didn't know if I'd ever see this again, so I had to take it. This is a compilation that I listened to and I really, really enjoyed. This is Gino Washington, Love Bandit. I don't know if he ever had any proper records, just some singles maybe. Uh, and this is a compilation of a lot of those singles. Uh, it's just really excellent vocal music, not quite doo-wop per se, but early vocal music. I think he has such a unique voice and the songs were ahead of their time, in my opinion. The first single, Puppet on a String, is 
absolutely stellar. If you're gonna let one track try to win you over with this, go listen to that. Um, but this is a really unique comp, and I can't believe this guy never put out any official records. What a what a talent. This is a late 60s pressing of Gilberto Gil's debut album. I will never try to pronounce that on video, but it's this one. Beautiful, beautiful record. Um, some early samba and a little bit of bossa on there. Just a fantastic, minimal record from Gilberto Gil at the start of his career. Beautiful album. And this is a Brazilian press from the late 60s, and it sounds excellent um i just yeah this is one i had to take home you don't see this in the states very often this is chet baker's albert's house so i don't know a lot about jazz as you guys know and chet baker I, i've liked what i've heard but i really don't know that much about his music i wanted to listen to this because of the cover and i was curious about it and i listened to it by myself at the shop one day no one came in for the entire duration of me listening to this and i was just really really sinking into it and enjoying the vibe there were some sounds on here that almost sounded like the same tones as like the original NES, like the Nintendo Entertainment System. Like these are kind of video game like synths in addition to the obvious trumpeting from Mr. Chet Baker. And I thought this was a really kind of somber record, but interesting. It, it provided a lot of texture that I didn't normally find in other Chet Baker stuff I've heard and other jazz music in general. And then I went online to see that most people said this is not a great record and it's like not well respected within his catalog, but I loved it. How to Destroy Angels, Welcome Oblivion. This is a experimental electronic record that Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails did with his wife. I wish this project would have another full album because this is just an excellent record front to back. If you enjoy electronic music, but you also enjoy a little bit of that Trent Reznor brilliant brain mixed in there and you haven't heard this album, you gotta. Now three back to back bangers to end this. We got a 1990 press of The Misfits Static Age. I'm getting more and more into Danzig as the months pass and uh, you know I love his solo career. Career. Misfits, I'm starting to really love as well. Uh, I tracked down a legacy of brutality not that long ago, and now I have Static Age. This is just a slamming punk rock record. I think this record, front to back, every song is good. And I know there are a couple represses that exist, but an early pressing of this made me want to jump in on it. So uh, yeah, I had to take this one home. All right, you ready for these next two? I don't know if you're ready. This walked through the door. This walked into the store, a first pressing of Gabor Sabo's Dreams widely regarded as his best record. Uh, Gabor Sabo is one of my favorite jazz musicians. He's a guitarist, Hungarian guitarist. I'm part Hungarian, maybe that's why I love his music so much. But this record is a mystical masterpiece. It is so dark and brooding and edgy for its time. And it's uh, just so slinky and I don't know, everything about this record is a 10 out of 10. And I have the Vinyl Me Please reissue, which is from the analog tapes, and it sounds great, but I listened to this, which I would say plays at VG Plus at worst, probably a little better. Um, and I, I think that it does sound better than the Vinyl Me Please version. And I know that might be biased based off of wanting it to sound better uh, to justify keeping it, but I listened with Goose, and Goose has an original as well, and he agrees that the original has more warmth uh, a little more life to it than the repress, which kind of makes sense because it's hard to kind of capture the energy of that era even when you're replicating it down the road for the most part. So really, really excited to own a first press of this. And last but not least, this didn't necessarily walk in in a collection, but I did meet the guy because he lived locally and he came to the shop and delivered it to me. This has been on my want list for so many years and it was on many videos of me trying to get this record um, and failing. And... Um, I finally got it. And I paid up for it, but I think I paid a fair price. This is a first US press of Funkadelic's Maggot Brain. Now, this is one of the greatest funk records of all time, without a doubt. So many samples came from this record, but the record has some of the most intense and beautiful tracks that exist within the funk landscape. Um, this is such a good album and the represses do not do it justice. But I have heard before buying this that the first press of Maggot Brain doesn't sound like mind blowing, but certainly better than the reissue. And how I feel after listening is it is the best sounding version I've ever heard. It was graded at VG plus. It looks VG plus. It looks very clean. Um, and I will say that on side B, there are a few little crackling moments, a few little ticks, nothing really that distracting, but definitely, uh, when you listen for the first time, you kind of hone in on it. I think on future listens, I won't notice most of this sounds near mint. And I do think that, like I said, this is the best I've ever heard this album sound. 
I don't know if the UK or German first pressing sound better. There's not a consensus I could find on Discogs. Everyone's asking in the comments, but no one's really answering. But very happy to own this. I can say this blows any repress I've heard out of the water. Uh, and finally, I can add it to my collection. So really stoked on that. And there you have it. Those are the records I've taken home over the past few months, uh, or at least I'm taking them home now. I put them aside to talk about in this video. But if you like this video, I'd appreciate you giving it a like and a comment. Comments really help drive the algorithm to help my videos get recommended to you guys. Uh, and that really helps the channel. This is a long one, but uh, I think it was a good one. I hope you took some great recommendations out of this, and I look forward to chatting with you guys about them in the comments below. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, now's a good time to do it, and there's more videos coming very soon. So thank you so much for watching. Take it easy.